Today we take up a taste of Armageddon. Compliance, the final frontier. Tom Fox is the voyager of trekking through compliance. His mission? To explore the original series and seek out and share what it can teach you about compliance. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Today, we take up a taste of our Armageddon, which aired on February 23, 1967, and occurred on Stardate 3192.1. The Enterprise is en route to star cluster NGC 321 to open up diplomatic relations with the civilizations there, including the planet Aminiar 7, the principal planet of the star cluster. However, Amini R7 sends a code 710 signal telling the Enterprise not to approach under any circumstances. The Federation knows very little about Amini R7 except that it has had space travel for several centuries but never ventured out beyond its own solar system. The Federation also knows that when Amini R7 was first contacted, it was at war with Vindicar, its closest neighbor. However, the Federation ship making the report was never never returned, and was listed as lost in space. Uh, Kirk, Spock, and other members of the crew beam down and are met by a security attachment who takes them to Anon-7, the members of the High Council. Anon-7 claims Amini R-7 has been at war with Vindicar for 500 years, although there is no evidence of warfare to the landing party who witnessed a fusion bomb attack. Um... Unfortunately, the Enterprise is declared destroyed by a tri-cobalt satellite explosion from Vindicar, and all persons aboard the Enterprise are ordered to report for a disintegration within 24 hours. Kirk and the landing party are held hostage. Anon-7 tries to trick the Enterprise into sending its crew down, but are unable uh, to do so. Then... Kirk and Spock escape and destroy one of the uh, disintegration stations. And and on Anon 7 orders uh, the planet to open fire on the Enterprise, but Scotty has taken the Enterprise out of range. The ambassador aboard the Enterprise uh, beams down, and he's almost disintegrated, but he is saved by Kirk and Spock. They disintegrate more uh, disintegration chambers and uh, then capture Anon-7 and the rest of the High Council. Faced with the consequences of real war, Ambassador Fox offers to mediate the negotiations, and that uh, concludes the story. An interesting factoid from this episode is that Armenia are used sonic weapons against the Enterprise. The episode was consistent with weapons being sonic because the Enterprise easily moved out of range. Your first thought was that the sonic weapons might be uh, inane to use against spacecraft due to sound not traveling in a vacuum. However, it makes more sense today than when the first episode aired. Think about this in terms of a video game. Players don't use weapons that make sense in real life. They use whatever is best set by the rules of the game. If sonic weapons are the only anti-ship weapons worth using in the rules of the situation or simulation, then people of a meteor might think that they are a good idea to use in reality. Because they don't know reality, they only know the rules of the simulation, which is what we had here. Star Trek, the original series, Return of the Archons. We have some interesting compliance and leadership lessons from this episode. We've talked about risk assessments uh, many times in this podcast series, and we will continue to do so because they form the very foundation of your compliance program. But what about uh, the last time you performed a risk assessment? In other words, when did you last assess your risk? What has changed? Unfortunately, now with the speed of which businesses, uh, or, or rather the world changes, Uh, businesses must respond in kind. Obviously, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was a watershed event in world geopolitical history. 
and it has changed business forever. So what are your risks now in terms of your supply chain? What are your risks in terms of your um, and a corruption program? What about trade and economic sanctions? What about what are your risks now in cybersecurity? What are your risks in ESG? All of these risks changed dramatically after the Russian invasion. And have you considered what those changes might mean for your organization? Number two, make sure your compliance communications are clear. There uh, was communication in this episode which either was ambiguous or was claimed to be ambiguous by one or more of the participants. Obviously, if your communications are ambiguous, it leaves it open to interpretation and perhaps incorrect interpretation. So you want to make sure your compliance communications are clear and succinct throughout your organization. If you're in an international organization, this may mean looking at the translations and make sure that the words uh, convey the proper meaning that you're uh, trying to communicate. And number three, discipline. Uh, we talk about discipline as one of the 10, formerly the 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program, but one of the key elements of an effective compliance program. But your discipline must be uh, proportional. So you shouldn't terminate when the offense does not allege or call for termination. How do you make that determination? Well, you have past practice and as a guide, uh, but in many ways it's common sense. So the compliance professional is the keeper of institutional and inst- institutional justice and institutional fairness at an organization, and that includes proportional discipline. I hope you will join me tomorrow where we take up this side of paradise. If you enjoyed this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, you can help it grow by sharing it with the biggest Trek fan you know. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.